make sales. I didn't get a Elliot Spitzer Polly Shore update on Jalen because I hear it was a walkthrough. And I like Jamison already out of the gate. Our young players are dominating in helmet and shells. Shit, yeah, baby. They are dominating. Dominating. <laughs> in an hour camp. So by the time I get dressed, drink three cups of water, run a couple sprints, my practice is over. They're dominating. Wow. Man. They took that hour of practice and turned it into a narrative. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. I will say this, though. I want to give my boy and Paisan brother, Nick Sirianni, some credit. And this goes to all of you out there. When asked the question about the right guard, yeah, Cam Jurgens is our starter today. <laughs> yeah. Woo! Spoken like a true coach, Sean Payton. He's, he's our starter as of today. Is, can, can that change by tomorrow? Can that change by tomorrow? Absolutely. Cam Jurgens is not going to win that job. Tyler Steen's going to win that job. You watch. By the end of the year, the Bama rookie will be the starting right guard for that team I guarantee you you thought it was just going to be easy for a guy to take that transition because Landon Dickerson did it you think Cam Jurgens is going to do it obviously the Eagle guys aren't telling you that he's the starter he's telling you that he's the starter on July 27th bang 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 <laughs> That's a boomerang reference, just in case you're keeping score. How you doing, everybody? Appreciate you coming aboard. Sirianni, man, subtly likes to tell you the way it is. If you can read through the tea leaves, he's telling you there's a battle for the right guard position. It's not set in stone. Just like the defensive tackle position with Jordan Davis is not set in stone. Jordan Davis is on the depth chart as the first team defensive tackle. That don't mean he's won that job. He hasn't done anything to deserve that job. Hasn't done anything to deserve that job. How you doing? Come on, maniac. You know what's going on here now, brothers. Absolutely, man. You know what's going on. They're going to have a battle for the running back position, right guard position, linebacker, safeties, some depth at corner. There's some jobs to be won here. Number three wide receiver. How you doing, Paisan? Woo! All right. So, tone goes like this to me before we started the show. But by the way, my boy Philly 500 will join me at 4.30 Eastern. Seth was awesome yesterday. I wish we had more time with him. We'll get him on again. So Sean Payton came off the top rope and then picked up Nathaniel Hackett and the Jets and did a big Van Vader powerbomb on him. Calling him the worst coach in the history of the National Football League. There are a lot of dead bodies there at the... Broncos camp, people in the back. We couldn't get a playoff. It was one of the worst coaching jobs in the history of the National Football League. Russell Wilson doesn't have all the blood on his hands on what happened a year ago. Come on, man. What's the end game to that, dude? Worry about your own freaking house. Are you now not getting enough attention or something, guy? You sound like LeBron James. Look at me. Look at me. What is that? Worry about your own thing, man. Shit, you got enough to worry about, guy. Sills, if you could move one player on the current Eagles roster to a different position, who would it be? Well, Lane Johnson to left tackle. 
and put Mulatto over at right tackle. If he's your better tackle, put him at the most important position. That's what I would do. You ask, I answer. If he's the greatest offensive lineman you've ever had, we'll put him at the most critical offensive position in line, left tackle. And see how he does over there. That's what I would do. But Lane's made a career at the right tackle. Okay. You, you guys think it's the same. It's not. And it's not even looked at as the same or perceived the same. Left tackles get paid more money. More left tackles make bigger money. That's what I would do. You asked me, I told you. Okay? So Sean Payton thought he'd come off the top rope like Superfly Snooker. Or is it something that we don't... Quan always tells me this. Sills with the obvious. Hey, Sean, did we not know Nathaniel Hackett was a horrible coach last year? I think everybody that's even an, even an outside football fan would go, yeah. Did Russell Wilson have a bad year? Yeah. Did they have horrible coaches? Yeah. Then he turns around and says we had a horrible offensive line, so he blames the players, Nathaniel Hackett, and everyone else, and then takes a shot at the Jets, who didn't want to go on hard knocks, for being on hard knocks, dude, shut the hell up and worry about your own deal. I mean, what, are you the voice of the league now? I personally think Sean Payton's overrated. He's got the same postseason record as Mike McCarthy. What's he done without? Explain to me what he's done without Drew Brees. What has he done without Drew Brees? Do you know who Sean Payton is? He's Phil Jackson. He's never had to have a shitty quarterback. He goes from Breeze to Russell Wilson. I don't know. How good a coach is he? We're going to find out about Matt LaFleur here, aren't we? With Jordan Love up in Green Bay, how good a coach he really is. We found out how good a coach George Seifert was when Steve Young had to retire. The guy turned out to be a stiff when he went to Carolina. <laughs> Yeah, this was everybody else's fault. It wasn't. Now, I get that. He's trying to deflect shade off his guy. He wants to build up Russell. Russell Wilson is so weak that he needs to have Sean Payton take a shit on someone else to make him feel better going into camp. Sounds like that guy needs a little bit more of a backbone. And I'm talking to quarterback. Dude, you need to really be propped up. By taking a crap on someone else so that your guy can feel better? And so your coach came to your little aid and said it was everybody else's fault but him. Okay. Wow, dude. Everything Pete, you know what's crazy? Every single thing that Pete Carroll is saying about or was saying about Russell Wilson is true. He's weak. He's soft. He's not the tough guy you think he is. He's not the leader you think he is. He demands a lot. You have to pamper him a little bit. It's true. I think everything Pete didn't like about the guy. I mean, Sean Payton has to really go in and take a shot at a guy who's been out of the building for months and who is the offensive coordinator of the New York Jets. And he feels that that's the end. That's what's the end game. Like, it's so unnecessary. And you want it to be public. Hey, dude, you can kind of go, hey, just in, you know, not putting my name on this or anything, and you're talking to a friend in the media or you think you have a friend in the media. This thing was a train wreck a year ago. You could do things subtly. But this guy did a power bomb on him. What a tool. People like that, you don't trust. Because you know why? You're all in this together. Coaches, players, this is a fraternity. You never know who you're working for one day. And you never know who's working for you. So you take a shit on each other, right? Most people don't do that. Players take a shit on an organization. And, and then coaches take a shit on the media. 
But never have I ever seen a coach just absolutely come off the top rope in a situation that everyone knew what was going on in Denver last year. And I want to do something here before I get into my Eagle topics. I want to do something here, and I want to use a better word than what I was going to use because I don't want to offend anybody here too bad. So I'll use the word cattle. Okay? I'll use the word cattle instead of something else. I'll use the word cattle. Let me give you a mentality of an NFL owner on how he sees the players as cattle. Okay, I'll use that word because most of you out there will take what I say, put it out there on the internet and call me a racist. So I'll, I'll, I'll use the word cattle because most of you can't handle it. Um, so Jim Irsay came out and thought he'd open up his pie hole talking about the running back position. You know why? He's preempting that he doesn't want to pay Jonathan Taylor already. This was collectively bargained. And this was collectively bargained in good faith. Really? You locked the players out for four months. Good faith? You locked the players out for four months, the owners did. After you ripped a CBA that still had years on it left and you didn't like the way the room was set because Gene Upshaw had a 50-50 split, why should the players make as much as us? That's why it's 52-48 now. Collectively bargained in good faith? Jim, you might want to go back and not think that that was a good statement because you're lying. Jim Irsay, either he's lying or he's doped up again on pills or drunk or both or he's dumb. Pick one. I don't know. Pick one. That was not collectively bargained in good faith when you locked the players out. And everybody who has ever done a collective bargaining agreement, no matter what the profession or business is, knows that modifications are made when you collectively bargain. When it wobbles, during business, up and downs, pandemics, what have you, business models and CBAs all are adjusted. Not in the NFL, though. You know why? Because they treat the players like, well, this is for you, cattle. Cattle. He talks down to the guys like he is a cattle owner. Is that good enough for you? Because I know some of you couldn't handle where I would really go. But he, he's got a he's got a cattle farm owner's mentality. Is that okay for you guys? I'm sure, you know, that's probably a little bit tempered there for you because I know most of you can't take it. That guy is now telling you he's not paying Jonathan Taylor when his contract comes up. Market value money. Prime example of a cattle owner and how people treat the players and owners treat the players. Guys like Hugh Culverhouse. Okay? Cattle owner. Talking down to his cattle. There you go. Uh, people in the media, you know, they don't have a backbone to stand with. And most of you can't take it because you're soft. Well, I hate owners like Jim Ursay. Guy puts his ass on the line, plays his balls off for you. Jonathan Taylor's been a great running back in Indianapolis. Since he came out of Wisconsin. What's this guy do? He's already setting the table talking shit on his player. Who's done nothing but play hard for him. That's why that organization's a train wreck. And always has been. That's why they don't win. They bullshitted the fans in Baltimore. They're bullshitting the fans in Indianapolis. They underachieved with Peyton Manning and Tony Dungy in Indianapolis. And it trickles down. That's why that guy sucks. Am I wrong? He doesn't look at his players as business partners. He looks at his players as cattle. Okay? All right. 
Can you imagine? You got a contract of a guy. He's going in the training camp, Jonathan Taylor. Jonathan Taylor is going in the training camp, getting ready for a great 2023 season, wants to play his ass off for the Colts. You got an owner telling you, and he's putting it out there. He's not going to pay you no matter what you do. You're going to have 2,500 yards this year. I'm not paying you. Oh, why should I play hard for you? Well, let me ask you this. Tone everyone else. Why wouldn't I make a business decision if I was a running back during a season? Why should I give you 100% of my effort if I get nicked up or a twisted ankle? Why should I go the extra mile for you? Do you understand what you're doing? And players would not look down on that. If you're not going to pay me, you're telling me no matter if I have 2,500 yards or 205 yards, you're not going to pay me anyway. Why wouldn't I make a business decision? Lamar Jackson made a business decision, and you still paid his ass. Why would Think about that. That guy didn't play in a goddamn playoff game last year. He didn't play the rest of the season. Remember what he said? He was 85%. Shit, both Hurts and Mahomes. And Jalen didn't have his money yet. They weren't playing at 100%, but they played. Lamar made a business decision. He's making $50 million now. If I'm a running back or any player that I feel is being hosed, dude, this is a message for every NFL player out there. The only way to change the market because your union sucks, and I'm a part of that union. I even posted my union card. On my Twitter page, your union blows. The only way that you're going to change this is if you start making business decisions. If you're 85% and you're in a contract year or you're making a ton of money, I'm not giving you the extra effort because you're not giving me the benefit of the doubt that we're going to have a collectively good conversation when my contract is up. Why should I? Give me one reason, if I'm a running back in the NFL right now, why I should go the extra extra length. Why? For For my teammates who are getting paid around me like in New York? Why should I do that? And by the way, anybody who doesn't think that players in the locker room wouldn't back that guy, you're assholes. If I saw a guy that was on my roster, and I saw how he was treated like Saquon Barkley, and he was 85% but didn't want to go in, I would say I would do the same thing. I would do the same thing. Why should I go the extra mile for you? This is going to be a problem one day. You're going to see players make more business decisions, especially at positions that the owners are trying to modify salary caps and franchise tag numbers on. Why would I give you the extra effort? Okay? JM goes, Brady Dungy underperformed? Well, according to Tone, won Super Bowl in Indianapolis? You don't believe that Tony Dungy should have won more Super Bowls with Marvin Harrison, Reggie Wayne, Marshall Falk, Edger and James, Dallas Clark, and Peyton Manning and Tony Dungy, and the um, Bill Polian. So you had a Hall of Fame general manager, Hall of Fame head coach, Hall of Fame quarterback, two Hall of Fame running backs, Hall of Fame wide receivers, and you don't think you should have won more than one Super Bowl. We'll agree to disagree on that. No, you're right. He overachieved. Anyway, once again, Shit, dude. JM. Roethlisberger won more Super Bowls at one place than Dungy did during the Brady era. Eli Manning won more Super Bowls than Peyton Manning did at Indianapolis. I mean, those two guys won more than one. 
you're right. They overachieved in Indy. Once again, though, if I'm a running back in the NFL or a safety or a linebacker, I would say this to you. If I'm 75 to 95%, I may not play for you. And if you don't like it, change it and pay me. India is one of the biggest underachievers in history. Tone, everyone tells me about the 85 Bears. You won one Super Bowl. Shit, Washington won three with three different with three different quarterbacks during that era. 49ers won five. Giants won two. I mean, okay. <laughs> I mean, that 85 Bears team underachieved. One Super Bowl doesn't one year doesn't make you great. It's all good, dude. I don't care. I would say this to you. What it, hey, if you worked in a building and you were giving max effort and your boss was continuing to underpay you, would you go the extra mile? Now, some people, again, it's just built in you because, dude, you know how deflating that is? When you work in a company that doesn't pay you for your value, do you know how deflating that is? We all know what that means because we're all in it. Do you know how deflating that is? You have to have like internal and intestinal fortitude in yourself and belief in yourself and keep pushing ahead because you push ahead, you're going to push through. And when you push through, whatever that looks like, here, there, over there, here, you're going to get there because you never lowered your own standards. You know when you're in a shitty company. You know it. The Colts are a shitty company. Guy comes out a year in advance. Year in advance. And tells his running back, you could go for 3,000 yards this year. I'm not paying you. Well, when you need me and I'm at 95%, I'm making a business decision because I'm getting the F out of here. I'm not playing for you. I'd rather take less money. Do you know if I'm Jonathan Taylor right now? I don't know if you guys feel this way, but if I'm Jonathan Taylor, I'd rather take less money and leave that environment because of what that guy did. I'd rather take less money than work for a guy like that. Just Mike says sometimes satisfaction is the only reward. After a while, though, Mike, those pats on the back don't work. Don't you get tired of pats on the back? We all have to grow up. Who in the who in the right mind wants pats on the back? Spike says, Sills is a Bucks fan. I'm not a Bucks fan. I played for him. Dude, you don't know me from a can of paint, Spike. I have no favorite team. That's why I could talk with truth. I don't have a favorite team. I had a favorite team when I was a kid because my uncle played in the Hall of Famer with the Giants. Okay? Other than that, I played for the Bucs. That's it. Don't mean I'm fan. I'm friendly with them, fans with them. They asked me to come and do things. Anyway, whatever. All right, let me move on. Not getting into a back and forth with people who want to try to justify winning one Super Bowl. Tony Dungy underachieved, JM. Completely underachieved. His best work was in Tampa. Not in Indianapolis. It wasn't. Underachieved. His best work is what he did in Tampa. Fans will never truly respect the athletes they root for. By nature, they only care about what they get out of it. The reality is these players are human beings that work for a company like most of us. We all want to feel valued. True. We all want to be compensated based off of our production. But that's never the case. You can love where you work. How many times have you ever added this up correctly 
and it all lined up great for you. You loved where you work. You were compensated for your work. You, you enjoyed the people that you worked with. How many times have all three of those things ever panned out? How many times in your life has that ever panned out for you? Then you'd be a lucky player or you'd be a lucky person. Okay? You would. All right. Let's move on to our topics here. By the way, someone do me a favor. Um, will somebody give me the Elliot Spitzer Shore um, update if we get one? Okay, will we, will, we, will we do me a favor? Will we get one? All right, here we go. We wrote down again some of the, it, because some of you guys yesterday had some of the issues that I was saying. And, you know, there was even a guy who came on the, um, the show who said, um, hey, Seals, you make it sound like the Philadelphia Eagles haven't been to the playoffs in the last 20 years. You got to understand something here, what we're doing. We're talking about a football team that has an opportunity to do something that hasn't been done in 53 years. You know what that is? Lose the Super Bowl, go back and win one. It's only happened one time the Kansas City Chiefs did it. And for me to believe the Eagles are going to do it, highly unlikely. The odds are against you. What helps you is the fact that the NFC sucks. There's a few teams. Now, again, War of Attrition is also going to play a factor in the AFC. Okay? Absolutely. So I wrote some questions down yesterday. Last night, I thought of a couple more, and I thought we'd hit on them. Some more questions that I have about the Eagles as they enter a training camp and get ready to defend the NFC championship. Let me throw this at you here. Do the Eagles really have a competition for the punter spot with the people they have in camp? They drafted a guy in Sippos. That's not a competition. That's surrendering. Is it really a competition? Why are you? The Eagles don't value a punter. Do you know that there's only one player on the field that could change field position for you to help your defense and your offense? That's the punter. If you have a weapon like that, you know, one of the things that the Raiders had during the 70s and early 80s, they had Ray Guy, Reggie Roby down in Miami. Do you think that there's any coincidence that during those guys' careers, those franchises won a ton of games, ton of division titles, and were constantly in conference championships? Why? Because if your offense and defense were not playing well, you had one guy on the field that could potentially change the field position for you and put you in a better position to try to at least win games. Even games you were outmatched in. Even game, there's no coincidence that when you have elite guys like that, your franchise is usually good because that one player can change field position for you. Okay? Totally change the game. All the great ones, if you look at their records, most of the, Reggie Roby, Ray Guy, Raiders and Dolphins were elite. T 10 games, 11, 12 games. They were constantly winning. Ton of three and outs in a game. Your putter, he's as a, as sometimes the punter is just as important as the quarterback, especially if your offense is stuttering. The Eagles don't have one. I don't truly believe that you really have a competition going on. You get two stiffs in the building. Matterism, man. Go sign the kid. He's been exonerated. Who gives a shit what some of you bleeding hearts think? Okay? Completely exonerated. 100% exonerated. Falsely accused. Kid did nothing. Go sign him. He could instantly help the Eagles more than any player that they've signed in the offseason. 
to bring into the – he'd be your number one offseason acquisition right now if you signed him. Okay? Ishmael goes, you lost me on that one? Why? He's been exonerated. He did nothing wrong. But of course, because you read Twitter and the internet, <laughs> he's innocent. The district attorney said it. He's innocent. Oh, yeah. You think you're going to win championships with quiet boys? Exonerated. Exonerated. That's all I need. I'm not running a prayer service here. I'm running a football team. Second question. What linebacker do you believe steps up this year? You don't have any linebackers right now. As of July 27th, you got dudes' names on a depth chart. Who steps up? Who becomes a player in your linebacking core? It's the weakest linebacking core in the National Football League. I looked at the linebackers around the National Football League. I would put the Eagles at the bottom third for experience and talent when it comes to your linebacker room. You got one of the worst linebacker rooms in the United in the NFL. You all remember that year the Chargers were number one in offense and defense but missed the playoffs because their special teams were so bad. Brandon, that's because the Spanos family refuses to spend money on special teams, and that's why they don't win games, or hold leads in playoff games. Okay? The Eagles have one of the worst linebacker rooms in the NFL, and you know it. These players are going to... Someone has to step up. Someone has to step up. And you're all hoping it's Dean. I don't know the kid can play yet. We'll see. As of today, you don't get red shirt years in the NFL. Only quarterbacks get red shirt years. Well, you know, he had a chance to learn behind Kaiser White. Really? You heard what Seth did. Seth played the Sam, the Will. Then he transitioned into the Mike. But he played on Gang Green. What's the difference between Seth Joyner and Gang Green and Nicobe Dean in this defense? Nothing. Seth was a later pick. What's the difference? Seth was on a more talented defense than you had a year ago. That defense that Seth Joyner played on led the NFL in points allowed, rush defense, Pass defense. He played on that. It was the top unit in the league for three years. Okay? He played. Dean didn't. Seth said it yesterday. Went from Sam to Will to Mike. He goes, that's how I made my transition. That guy never saw the field unless you were doing some sort of mop-up work. <laughs> and get this. Seth Joyner was like a sixth-round pick, fifth-round pick, something like that. Surely there were more veteran guys and supposed talented guys on Buddy Ryan's 46 defense back in the day when they brought Seth Joyner in. Seth started making those transitions in 86. When Buddy was brought in. Okay. Worst linebacking core in the league as of right now. You got a guy from Chicago. You got another guy you're hoping. 
What's the guy's name? The backup guy that you're talking about? And Dean. Who, who, who's the guy that looks like everyone's like all of a sudden now starting to fall in love with? Seth was an eighth round pick. Tone's right. It doesn't even exist anymore. He would have been an undrafted free agent. Seth Joyner wouldn't have got drafted. So you got Christian Ellis. I thought he was named after a pair. Is that guy named after a pair of jeans? Or shoes? Oh, that's Christian Louboutin. I'm sorry. Is that right? I don't know. What do I know? Okay. Got a great linebacking core. Do we really? Who? Christian Louboutin. He's 6'3", 233. That would be an improvement as far as I'm concerned because with the guys you lost a year ago, you're smaller. You're smaller. All right, let's move on. I don't want to beat that up. I did it yesterday. Here's another one for you. You think the Eagles have enough depth at corner? You think they have enough depth at cornerback? So if like Bradbury goes down, or and Bradbury's not even on a top 100 players in the league, I, that's a complete. That's not. That's not honorable, because he is a really good ball player. I I like him. Okay, I I like James Bradbury. I do. I don't like Slay anymore. I think Slay's out of gas. I think that guy is going to look like Jalen Ramsey did last year with the Rams. He'll get beat early, and then he'll have an excuse of injuries and shut it down. That's what I see in that guy because his ego is bigger now than his ability. He couldn't take it in the offseason that other people were getting love and money, so he opened up his pie hole, and in my opinion, what will happen He'll shut this bitch down. You watch because after he starts getting beat because he's playing against better quarterbacks, you watch what he does. That's my prediction on him. You watch. Okay? Jalen Ramsey, I saw that, man. I hope everything's cool with him. Got hurt today down in Miami. Um, and they're really counting on him to be a force and factor on that Dolphin defense with Vic Fangio. Um. You're telling me you have enough depth at corner. I don't know if you do. We're going to find out. Okay. Drafted a couple guys. Rookies. No experience. Okay. There's no veteran experience. You see, you know what you could have did a year ago? You had Gardner Johnson in the slot, right? Well, if one of those guys got hurt, you could have moved him back to his natural position and played him at corner. You had depth a year ago. I don't know you have the depth this year to sustain an injury like you had a year ago. You can move more. You had more movable pieces um, last year than you did this year. The current depth, that corner is there, but they're definitely unproven. Right. That's more my point than whether they're good or not. And let me ask you this. So you think running backwards 35 times a game, guy's never done it in the NFL versus Justin Jefferson as a rookie or facing Josh Allen or Mahomes or Aaron Rodgers and you're a rookie. How do you think that's going to look? You think you're comfortable with that? We're going to find out if one of your guys goes down. To Tone's point, I don't care what kind of talent you have. You think you got Sauce Garner behind one of these guys? I do not. Again, we'll see. Here's another one for you. Will one of the new defensive tackles play to the Level of play of Hardgrave a year ago in 2022. 11 sacks. What was it, 60 tackles? 
Do you think you have a defensive tackle on your football team right now that is going to give you Javon Hardgrave numbers of a year ago? Hey, Tone, do me a favor or someone. How many tackles did he have? I think he had 11 sacks a year ago. Okay, I, th- I think it was 11 sacks. I want to say he had 60 tackles, 55 tackles, somewhere in there. Do you think you have a guy right now? So you, Mike thinks that Jalen Carter in his rookie year is going to equal 11 sacks, 60 tackles, and 10 tackles for loss. 16 quarterback hits. He thinks Jalen Carter is going to do that this year. Just Mike just said he believes that Jalen Carter will have 11 sacks, 10 TFLs, 60 tackles, and 16 quarterback hits. Really? Hmm. 37 solos. Almost 40 solo tackles. King Brown goes, um, I don't think so, and I'm an Eagle fan. Davis ain't giving you any sacks. He'd probably give you four. Carter, if he can give you six, seven, and you can equal that, it took two guys to equal what Hargrave did. That means this. You got Lesser in rotation, too, because you had Sue and Lin, Linville Joseph a year ago. You understand what we're talking about here? It's going to take two guys to equal one. Well, who's your rotation guy? Milton Williams? Okay, and I like him. Milton Williams, though, no disrespect to Milton Williams, ain't a Dominican Sioux, even at this age. And if you're going to tell me I'd rather have rotation guys like Sue and Joseph helping out in a run game than having to have two guys try to equal what Hardgrave did, you're going to have to have two guys equal what Hardgrave. I don't believe that. And I like Carter. I think you're not going to equal that total. 60 tackles? 10 tackles for loss? You really think you're going to equal that total? You're gonna, it's going to take two guys to equal that at best. Remember, I said this. Keep an eye on that stat. Keep an eye on that stat. And, and hey, listen. I've said it to you, and I'll say it again to you. I think that Jalen Carter is going to be a star. But I'm talking about 2023 here. Are you going to be able to duplicate the stats that Hardgrave put out there in 2022? No way. You So listen to this one. You don't, you have to replace 60 tackles, 10 TFLs, 11 sacks. Then you have to turn around and you have to replace four interceptions and 160 tackles. Then you have to turn around and replace 91 tackles with Epps. I sure hope you have your confidence hat on. You're going to need it. You truly think you got a safety back there that's going to get you 91 tackles? Here's another one. How do you get Nolan Smith on the field? How do you get him on the field? I like him. There, there's a, there seems to be an it factor with this kid for me. I, I like him. I do. I like him. I've liked him from day one, and I didn't like him pre-draft. I, I, I thought I just didn't see. I go, it's kind of, you know, he's kind of reminding me of a little bit. He's reminding me of my, my friend Kevin Green, God rest his soul. You see, the Rams, they really didn't know how to play him when they first got him because he was like one of those tweener guys. He's not really a great linebacker. 
and he's kind of too small to put down in a three-point stance. So he became a tweener, one of these guys that was a hybrid guy, and they rushed him, and they figured out a position for him, and he turned out to be a Hall of Fame guy. They really didn't know how to work Kevin Green. Okay? Actually, pre-draft, it's not like you didn't like him. Just that, right? That that that's that's fair. That's that's see, that's that's a better take right there, Tone. You're right. I didn't think he was the tenth pick. That's right. I, yeah, that I I thought he was a first round prospect. I just didn't think where people were talking about him being in the top ten. I I, I never thought he. But now I like him. I like him because the way he, he handles himself, speed, his athleticism. The organization loves him. Tracy thinks he's a star in the rising. And so when Tracy says it, I'm with him. I'm, 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 I'm going to obviously always give Tracy Rocker the benefit of the doubt. You know what they're figuring? They're, they got to get him on the field, they're thinking. How are they going to get him on the field? That's going to be something. Um, you have to get him on the field. Okay? And I did. I did say that I think this kid could lead this team in sacks. If you figure it out, if you figure it out, he could be a force in your pass rush. Dude, 4-3. I don't know. I don't care what anyone says. You run a 4-3 and you're as athletic and you're a good football player, you got to find a place for him. You just can't sit him on the sidelines chewing on ice. I want to find a spot for this guy. How are the Eagles going to get him on the field? Again, I'm not ripping anything here. But what I am doing, I'm going to say this to you. I think Vic Fangio would have found a place and designed a package like Jim Johnson did for Hugh Douglas. Well, Sean Desai had that same kind of latitude. And, and let me throw this at you. So if you're Sean Desai and you got Matt Patricia as a hawk over you, I saw the comments that Sirianni said, man, he's been a great asset for me. Are you threatened by that? That you have a watchdog over you? Human nature would tell you, yes. This, this is my defense. Kind of. That's what they're... He's the defensive coordinator for the Eagles. Kind of. Kind of. Boy, I sure haven't heard Nick Sirianni talk about, wow, I'll tell you what, it's an upgrade having Sean Desai as the D coordinator in the building. Man, I'll tell you what, man, we're already seeing some of the new wrinkles, and we're already seeing some of the new installments and installations that he's putting into the defense. Those installments, man, they really look like they're going to be a force this year, which means we're probably going to be more aggressive. I haven't heard any of that. I heard this. Man, I'll tell you what, man, having Matt Patricia around here is a godsend. He's somebody I defer to. Holy shit. You don't defer to your D.C.? Okay. You might not feel threatened by that, but I would. So you got a consultant for your defense. Why? He hasn't even been a coordinator in one game yet. You, you mean, I don't know. You wouldn't feel threatened. Not me. It's the Eagles. So if you at your job, your boss goes like this, he hires someone. And you're the boss of a department. And your boss hires a guy to sit next to his office. And he's been brought in to be a consultant for your, for your division. You wouldn't feel threatened by that. Hmm. Well, you're a better man than me. Latif goes, I believe they'll be professional. Why would I be professional when you're hiring somebody to watch over me? 
Why would I be a pro? Being a pro is let people do their jobs. That's a pro. When an organization hires somebody and empowers that person, do you know how you become professional? By empowering people, not by watching over them and not by sticking your face into rooms that you have no place sticking your face into. That's, that's not professional. That's meddling. That's what Jerry Jones does. That's meddling. Just saying. Not me, Phils. I wouldn't feel threatened. <laughs> Keep it going, guys. I love it. Here's another one. Does Derek Barnett make the team? Help me out on this one. What's he doing in Philly? What's Derek Barnett doing on your roster? I've never seen a guy. Well, how many red shirt ears does he have now? Six? Five? I've, I've, I've lost count of how many years he's been on scholarship in Philly. How many years? Six? Six years. Six years he's been on scholarship. Okay. Why? He's not produced. He's taking a roster spot away. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to figure out why is he on your football team? Why is he on your team? Is there a place for Derek Barnett on the Philadelphia Eagles in 2023? Do you think he makes the roster? Howie doesn't want to have to cut another first rounder, does he? Is that what this is? How many first rounders has Howie actually cut in the last three years? Let's see. Rager, he got nothing for. He let loose Andre Dillard. And this will be another one of Derek Barnett. So all those first-round draft choices have not panned out. Derek Barnett, do you understand what Derek Barnett and the significance? Do you guys know what the significance of Derek Barnett is? Do, do you understand what the significance of Derek Barnett is? If Derek Barnett had panned out to be what Derek Barnett was supposed to be when they evaluated him, Hassan Reddick's not on your team. But because of the failure of Derek Barnett, the organization had to go buy a rusher and an edge rusher. They had to go buy one. Okay? So it cost them a first-round pick. Well, Rager, Dillard, Wentz, and Barnett have been stiffs. Three premium positions. Quarterback, left tackle, wide receiver, and edge rusher with Barnett. All three positions that the football team had to go out and make acquisitions. How about this? All three, they had to, all four actually, like Tony just said, all four, they had to go into the market to replace their failures in the draft. Okay. Well, no, because they covered it with uh, Mulata. They got lucky in the seventh round with Mulata. Seventh rounders, really? Okay. Look, it's Stoutland. It's not luck. I give it to you. Okay. But you failed on a left tackle. You failed on a wideout. You had to go get AJ. You're failing at an edge rusher in Barnett. You had to go get Hassan. Right? And you had to draft another quarterback, and you failed at that with once. All four premium positions. He failed in the draft on. It's not an opinion. His actions speak to it because he released those other three. 
and Barnett's still on the team for some reason. You failed at edge rusher, you failed at quarterback, you failed at receiver, and you failed at edge. Now, look, he's not immune to missing in the draft. I'm not just 17 of the 22 guys that were in a Super Bowl were drafted. That's a great record over the last four years. And they have gotten better. And they have gotten better. Okay? Two zero zero nine says that Wentz and Barnett were great in the Super Bowl year. Dude, when you draft a guy, like I said to you, one year doesn't make a career. I don't give a shit what you did. When you draft a guy in the first round, you're drafting a starter for 10 years, you're hoping. That's what the goal is. It doesn't have to be a pro bowler. He's got to be a starter. First rounders are not rotation DTs. You draft in the second, third, and fourth for rotation. Guy's been on your team six years. Six years. Okay. He says that Barnett and Wentz weren't stiffs. Okay. Okay. I'm going to get to my my other Eagle topic here in a second. Got a ton of questions here. I love this time of year too, dude. So much stuff going on. So much stuff going on. Um, our entire D line is a rotation. Don't don't you get our your entire D line is a rotation. Last year, your rotation was Adamic and Sue, Linville Joseph, Javon Hardgrave, and Fletcher Cox. With a sprinkle of Jordan Davis. This year, your rotation is Jalen Carter, Jordan Davis, Milton Williams, and the dude from the Saints. You're trying to tell me you think your rotation this year will equal the rotation in the production of a year ago. Good luck. You won't have a D tackle on your football team. Put up 60 tackles and 10 TFLs and 16 hits on the quarterback and 11 sacks. Not a chance in hell. Nobody will. I'm hoping Jalen Carter can get near six sacks, seven sacks. Okay, that's a lot to ask from a rookie. Be a better rookie year than Jerome had. Jordan Davis is not going to give you that. He'll be around 30 tackles max with three sacks. Write it down. Okay. Eagle guy goes, this idiot thinks Linville Joseph is Aaron Donald. No, I think with the, it, who said that? Once again, Eagle fan hears what he wants to hear. The only reason that your boy Reddick took off in the second half of the season is because the pathetic run defense you had in the first eight games was rectified by Howie by bringing those guys in. Okay? You were pathetic. You were at 22. Your run defense for two years has been below average. Now you got lesser experience, idiot. And the effect that Linville Joseph and Adami Kinsu had on your run defense allowed for 70 sacks because you could rush off the edge. You can't stop the run. They'll do what the Chiefs did to you the first year they played Nick Sirianni's coaching staff. They'll kick the shit out of you. Can you imagine that? Think about what that jackass just said here. A team like Kansas City who doesn't even run the ball ran the ball down your throat at Lincoln Financial for 238 yards. Mahomes didn't even have to break a sweat. They blew you off the field in your own barn. By your own game. Not a lie. Facts. Facts. We'll see. 
Woo-hoo. I can't. Hey, man, this is going to be a fun year. Holy cow. What an absolute fun day. Yes, sir, man. My boy Philly 500 is going to join me at 430 Eastern. We got a problem. Houston, we have a problem. By the way, I want to dive into your, um, let me see. What would you call your collection of running backs? A quorum? (laughs) What, what What would you call these guys? A village? What would you call your running back room? What, what would you call your running back room? Let's see, a village, a quorum. Um, I want to dive into it here and throw some facts at it. What, what, let's see what Tone says. A bundle. <laughs> yeah. Like getting your cable. Can I bundle it? <laughs> yeah. St- <clears throat> look, at, look at it. Stacked. With what? Oh, this is going to be fun. A stable of thoroughbreds. Three-headed beast. Yes, sir, baby. A platoon. A bushel. A harem. <laughs> I actually like I like the harem. All right. Hour number two, my boy Philly 500 will join us. Keep it right here on the National.